in that area. Turn in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. Looking today in verses 50, 43 to 52 at the arrest and the betrayal of Jesus. This study we're taking through Mark is reaching a crescendo pitch as well, isn't it? We're going to preach on this in a minute. I want to tell you where we're going the next couple of Sundays. Next Sunday, the 30th of October, is Reformation Sunday, recognized by churches who appreciate our Reformation heritage all across the world, and we'll be, we'll be taking a look at that. And the following Sunday is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, November the 6th. And the last Sunday before the presidential election, we will be not only celebrating the Lord's Supper, not only reciting our covenant together, not only sharing a fellowship meal, we're going to be looking at these two things, the reality of persecution around the world now and the inevitability of persecution coming here, even to the heartland, coming here. We're going to look at the scripture on those things. Today... Mark chapter 14, verses 43 to 52, as we think about the arrest of Jesus. I hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put it on the screen for you, but I want to encourage you to seek us out if you don't have your own Bible. We want to get you one. You need to have your own copy of the Bible. Let's stand together. Follow along, if you would, as I read this passage. And immediately, while he was still speaking and I would I would remind you that what he was speaking was telling the disciples it's okay to sleep now I'm not going to try to wake you up anymore I'm not going to encourage you to stay awake anymore the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners let us be going my betrayer is at hand while he's still speaking that Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him, that is his followers, they all left him and fled and the young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. This is tragic. But it's teaching to us. What is it? It's the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And we want to study it today. Recognize the enemies of Jesus. Ask ourselves, are we in that number? Recognize the faithfulness of Jesus and then ask ourselves where are we in this thank you please be seated well he has endured the agonies of Gethsemane struggling sweating as it were drops of blood from his brow in anticipation of the awful experience of becoming, so he's saying about he, he became sin who knew no sin. That's right out of Second Corinthians five, that we might become his righteousness. He is staggered in Gethsemane, in the horrible anticipation of a reality he had never known. All he'd ever known was face-to-face -face fellowship with the Father. He abandoned that for a season to come to this dusty world, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem us from the curse of the law. But even then when he was here on earth, apart from that face-to-face -face fellowship, he communed with the Father in prayer. It was never broken. But in a few hours, that face-to-face -face fellowship and communion with the Father will be exchanged for unspeakable agony and the abandonment of the Father as the Father pours out his wrath upon him.
just as he faced temptation in the wilderness to begin his ministry. He struggles with the accusations of the enemy of our souls in the garden. He asked his followers to draw near with him. They had boldly proclaimed at the table earlier, we will never abandon you. Others may, but we will die for you. We pointed out last week how fickle people are. They couldn't even stay awake with him. <laughs> and now, with an incredible self-denying boldness, he faces his accuser coming to betray him. He was the suffering servant. He was Jehovah's servant. And though he struggled with the bitter cup that was about to come to him, <coughs> he did not shrink back from it. He embraced it. One of the old writers said, he had said before to Judas at the table, that which you must do, do quickly. The people didn't, they didn't understand what he was talking about, obviously. But it showed, this writer says, the promptness of Christ's heart to the work. And though he knew the sorrows which it must induce, yet for the joy that was set before him, that is the joy of doing the Father's will and seeing uh, the accomplishment, he endured the cross, despising the shame. So much so that he could say in John 13, as we studied a couple of Sunday nights ago, that he was now glorified. And this writer says, never lose sight of these two things. These grand points, he calls them, in the sufferings and death of the Lord Jesus. One is the infinite dignity of his person, God and man in one. The other is the free will offering that he made where he offered himself freely without hesitation. <clears throat> I want us to look for a few minutes this, this morning at this passage from three considerations. First, the arrest of Jesus and misunderstanding his kingdom. It's the bulk of the passage, verses 43 to 48. Then the arrest of Jesus and the fulfillment of scripture, verse 49. Then the arrest of Jesus and the fickleness of his followers, verses 50 to 52. First of all, the arrest of Jesus and misunderstanding his kingdom. The text tells us immediately while he was still speaking to them about the betrayer coming, Judas came. He was one of the twelve. What a privilege. Talk about squandering privilege. Talking about sinning against light. One of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Let me say parenthetically, you know, it is, it is tragic and appalling to us today how in the name of religion, and I, and I still maintain that Islam is a, is, a, is a political worldview that wraps itself in a veneer of religion, but, but it's recognized as a world religion. It advances its cause with, with the sword. Well, let's not forget that there was a time in Judaism when they advanced their cause with swords. And how ironic that those who were looking for the Prince of Peace would cut him down with their weapons. They came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Think for a moment about the enemies of God. We expect the world to be an enemy. And we, I think we betray ourselves sometimes when we look aghast at how, at how secular mindset, an ungodly mindset, an anti-God mindset rails against the things of God and in the advance of his cause. We shouldn't be surprised, and I think when we are, uh, we betray ourselves. We, we show that we're somewhat naive. We expect it from there. 
You wouldn't necessarily expect it from the religious elite, and yet that's exactly the crowd in Jesus' day. And I would submit to you that it hasn't let up, even today, that the religious elite set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed. Somewhat surprising. But then you see one of his very own. One who had fed at his hand. And I point this out to say we need to be careful, we need to guard our hearts, folks, that we not become unwittingly acting out the same agenda as the secular progressives who hate God, as the, the, the empty religionists who have their own idea of God and want to control God, that we not fall into that category because it can happen. Judas is living proof of that. That we not by our words and our conduct become just like them. And here's the irony. He betrays him with a kiss. A kiss, the universal sign of affection. The New Testament church was taught to greet one another with a holy kiss. And Judas took this sign of affection, of tenderness, of approbation. He took that and said, the one whom I kiss is the one you need to arrest. Betrayal of Jesus takes on different forms. The one I kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away. Not only is the expression shocking, but even as he betrays him, he calls him rabbi, teacher. He called Jesus his teacher. My question is, what is there evidence that he learned anything from Jesus? Brothers and sisters, we've got to guard our hearts. Betrayal of Jesus is subtle. You can kiss him. You can acknowledge him. And betray him. And they're told they laid hands on him and seized him. One of those, and we know from other gospel accounts who that person was, it was Peter who drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. The other gospel accounts tell us the fellow's name and tell us Jesus stopped long enough to pick up his ear and reattach it. Miraculous surgery on the spot. And then Jesus chides them. You've come out as against a robber, swords and clubs to capture me. And what this shows us is they, they totally misunderstood his kingdom. In fact, they, I think they'd been lied to about it. He says he has a kingdom. He says he's a king. You know what that means? He wants to take over. He wants to bring down Rome. He wants to upset the apple cart here. We Jews, we Jewish leaders have a very tenuous peace with Rome. And this, this insurrectionist, this radical, this rabble rouser wants to come in and set up his own kingdom. It'll bring, it'll bring the, the, the wrath of Rome down upon us. They had lied about him. They mis totally misunderstood his kingdom. And he would say to Pilate later on, in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not from here. He never claimed that he was going to set something up in his first coming. He always, when he started making claims about it, 
definite descriptions of it was that it was going to be a kingdom in which he died and rose again. One of the writers I was reading this week said the cause of truth, of God's truth, does not need force to maintain it. False religions, and this was an older writer, and you can tell this by his next description, false religions like Mohammedanism. Now, Mohammedanism was the language they used to use in the, in the 1800s for Islam. False religions like Mohammedanism have often been spread by the sword. False Christianity, like that of the Roman church, has often been enforced on men by bloody persecutions. But the real gospel of Christ requires no such aids as these. It stands by the power of the Holy Spirit. It grows by the hidden influence of the Holy Ghost on men's hearts and consciences. And there's no clearer sign of a bad cause in religion than a readiness to draw the sword. Paul would say in the letter to the Corinthians that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But he would go on to say, but they are mighty. We've talked about that. We've talked through that, so I won't rehearse that today. But simply would remind you that the kingdom of Jesus Christ is not of this world. It will not be brought in by who sits on the Supreme Court. It will not be brought in by who inhabits the White House. It will not be brought in by whatever majority, some so-called moral majority in Congress. Now we as a moral people, as citizens with dual citizenship here and in heaven, ought to do all that we're allowed to do within the parameter of the liberties that we have to see that we can, can bring our influence to bear in those arenas. I'm not suggesting we retreat from them, but I am pleading and appealing that we not put our hope in these. I have friends, look, I have friends who will need to be on medication on Wednesday, November the 9th if a certain candidate is elected president. The kingdom of Jesus Christ was never designed to be brought in by political force or military force. It's like a little, a little leaven in the yeast and it works its way through. It's like a seed planted that grows into a tree that can house and cover. So. With all that's going on in the world and in our country right now, we've got to be sure that, that we do not neglect to invest our energies in advancing the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is spiritual. I hate abortion. I hate it. It is the slaughter of innocent children. And I would love to see Roe versus Wade overturned. It's a pernicious, wicked, from the pit of hell law. But I'm not naive. The only thing that stops abortion is a changed heart on the part of the abortionist parading, masquerading as a doctor. One thing that stops it is, is for the head of Planned Parenthood to get a good dose of Jesus Christ. That'll stop it. So yes, as Christians who happen to be Americans, we labor within the parameters, but we pray. We pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done in abortion clinics as it is in heaven. In the hearts of young ladies who lose their way, who let merchants of death convince them that they can choose to take a life within their womb. What's going to stop that? One thing, folks, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ 
I hate prejudice and bigotry, and I hate it particularly when I see it rise up in myself. I've told you before about my background. And I was raised in a context in southeast Texas where pejorative terms of other races were commonplace. Where I sat under a pastor who claimed that people of African American descent had no souls. So that's my background. I hate prejudice and, and racist attitudes. But there's not a law on the books that can stop that. But there is a gospel that can stop that. You said they totally misunderstood the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're not careful, we will, we will draw the conclusion that the gospel, whether we say it aloud or not, that the gospel is not working. We've got to look to other means. We've got to look to certain people to help us. We need to come back to the psalmist. I will lift my eyes unto the hills because that's where my only real help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. Secondly, the arrest of Jesus constitutes the fulfillment of Scripture. It was, it was shocking. He'd been telling them, I'm going, as it has been written, to be betrayed into the hands of the Jewish leaders. Said it several times. And yet when it happened, it was shocking. He chides them. He says, day after day I was with you in the temple teaching. And you didn't seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. It was the fulfillment of scripture. This is, this is the tension that we must hold, brothers and sisters. If you let go of either end, you're in trouble. There's a, there's a tension here in the absolute sovereignty of God and the absolute responsibility of man. We read about it, and we read uh, responsively from Matthew's Gospel. The Son of Man goes, as it has been written, to be betrayed. It was, it was predicted. The Son of Man goes, as it has been written. As the, the Old Testament has foretold, prophesied, predicted, assured that I would be betrayed. What's the rest of that? But woe to the man who betrays me. And then the most astounding thing is said. It would be better for him if he had never been born. And I read that. And I say as I was thinking about this this week and meditating upon it. Lord, would it have been better? Would the world have been better off? If I had never been born. Judas had been on the receiving end of every gospel privilege. There's no indication from the scripture that he missed any of Jesus' teaching except what Jesus taught after, after Judas left that night to go and finalize his plans to betray him. Other than that, Everything you read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke up until that point, and in John until that point, Judas had been the recipient of that. He had seen the power of God. He had seen the compassion of God. Healing people who otherwise in that culture would have been hopeless. Raising people from the dead. Giving a son back to his mother. Giving a daughter back to her father. Giving a brother back to his sisters. He had seen this. He had tasted the goodness of the Lord. Yet the Hebrew writer in chapter 6 warns about those who have tasted the goodness of the Lord. Who have tasted the, 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 the work of the Holy Spirit. And in the face of that, to turn away. And it's impossible for them to be renewed to repentance. When Jesus says this, folks, we, it, it ought to challenge us. God is absolutely sovereign. We cannot and we must not excuse any of our sin unto the sovereignty of God. I had a fellow years ago who, who should have known better, and he, 
But he liked to hide behind God's sovereign problem. Well, you know, God's sovereign. And he would use that as an excuse for his laziness, for his complacency, for his apathy, for his duplicity. He would look me in the face and call me friend and stab me in the back when I wasn't looking. But God is sovereign. That cavalier attitude is an assault upon the character of God. He is absolutely sovereign in all things. And we are absolutely responsible for our sin. Whether it's sin by neglect or whether it's sin by thought or whether it's sin by action. We are absolutely woe to that one. Is there anything you can think of that we said, said worse about a person? He had been better off if he'd never been born. There may not be a thing that a child can say to his or her parents that cuts more deeply, I wish I'd never been born. Or a parent to say to a child, I wish you'd never been born. We look at that and that would be totally inappropriate for a parent to say and totally inappropriate for a child to say, but the Lord Jesus Christ says it of Judas. And it's totally appropriate when he says it. So here's the tension. Everything that happened here happened that the scriptures would be fulfilled. And I want to just show you, this is preached about, by the way, in Acts chapter 13. Paul is preaching at Pisidian Antioch, verses 26, 29. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath. He said, said, they read it and they heard it read and they missed it completely. Fulfilled them by condemning him, speaking of Jesus. And though they found him in no guilt, worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out, notice, all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. Paul, Paul squarely lays the fault upon the leaders and acknowledges that everything they did was written. It's the same thing Peter does in his, his sermon at Pentecost. Him being delivered unto you by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you with wicked hands put to death, Peter said. And that reality, the sovereignty of God unfolding his plan and the wickedness of people participating in it, that reality cut them to the heart and they cried out, what must we do? Yes, there is not any hope for us. What must we do? Well, thirdly, the arrest of Jesus and the fickleness of his followers. Again, verse 50, tragic. And they all left him and fled. The text we read last week, Peter said, I'll die for you. I won't deny you. And the text says, and they all joined in. Everyone said that. So we can't just say, well, that was Peter. You know, Peter's impetuous. He just, he often spoke and didn't think about what he was saying. But all of them agree. They didn't, it wasn't. Well, we got to guard our hearts, brother, sisters. We got to guard our hearts. I would submit to you that on earth at that time, there was not a group that you would look at that you would say had more faith, had more light, in which you, in which you put more confidence that if the gospel was going to advance, it was going to advance through these fellows. <laughs> there wasn't another group. This was it. This was the cream of the crop. These were his disciples, his followers, his students. We learn how the faith of true believers can give way in the press of the moment. They all left him and fled. Let us learn, one fellow wrote, 
from the flight of these 11 disciples not to be overconfident in our own strength. We talked to you last week about this, that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. The warning in Scripture, let him who thinks he stands, and I told you then, the picture is let him who thinks he stands erect. I can do this. I got this. I can handle this. Those are words that will doom you. When we recognize life, recognize our frailty, our infirmities, our weaknesses. When we learn enough about ourselves and about life to recognize our besetting sins and adjust life accordingly. If I know that I'm pre-diabetic, I'm not wise to hang around the candy shop in the mall. There's a shop in the mall, the Woodlands Mall, I don't know if you've ever been in it or not. It, you, can ju you walk in it, you can almost, I think I gain weight just walking in the place. Just the, the, the propensity of candy, the quantity, is unbelievable. It's outrageously expensive, which is a good deterrent. Big, tall cylinders of all kinds of Skittles and jelly beans and bags. And you just go up and just fill it up effortlessly. If I have that propensity, would you consider me wise to hang around that shop? No. You see, if we, if we understand... That there's a danger in being overconfident in our own strength. And we recognize the scripture's teaching that the fear of man brings a snare. And recognize that when, when we get appalled at what happens in our culture, we need to stop and realize, you know, except for the grace of God, if the oil of grace is not continually poured on this tinder box of remaining iniquity in me, if, it, if I let it get dry... A spark can set it ablaze and there's not a thing I have read about in the news that I am not capable of apart from the grace of God. You've got to know that. folks. If you don't know that, then here's what happens. The devil will tell you, well, you could just, just dance on the edge. You're safe because you're on the edge. But you've got to understand when the, when the enemy of our soul says come dance on the edge, he never wants you to stay on the edge. He just wants you to get close enough to the edge to get pushed over. One of the worst questions we can ask is what's wrong with it? When our worldview begins to be driven by what's wrong with it, then what's right about it goes down the tubes. So the questions ought to be asked, can I do this and glorify God? Can I do this and, and maintain the integrity of my witness for the gospel? Can I do this and uphold and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ? Can I do this and edify others? Can I do this and be a blessing to others? Those kind of questions need to be asked of, of followers of Jesus Christ. But what's wrong with it is, is the recipe to, for disaster. It, it, is the, it is the false confidence It is the playing with fire that ensures that we will be consumed in the flame. The scripture says be clothed in humility. So here's, and I'm not good at this, but I need to be better at this. We need to learn to be charitable toward the infirmity of others and, and ruthless on ourselves. Ruthless on ourselves. I'm called to deny myself. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ here today, you're called to deny yourself. It's the first thing he says. You want to come after me? Deny yourself, first thing. And I have to ask myself daily, what am I denying for the gospel? Now, there's two categories of this, clearly. You would not be impressed with me if I told you, you know, I, drove, I, I drove past the bank the other day on the way to the office, and you'll be proud of me. I did not stop and rob it. Well, well is that, I mean, that's, I guess that's a form of self-denial. I didn't, I didn't break the Eighth Commandment on the way, but... 
ourselves. Yeah, we ought to deny, we ought to fight and deny ourselves sin, the opportunity to sin. But there's, but there's a whole category of self-denial of the things we can legitimately claim for our own and yet for the greater glory of God, for the good of those we influence, for the sake of our witness, we will not. Otherwise, how are we different, finally, from those who left him and fled? And then there's this young man here. We don't know who this young man is. Bless his heart. We don't know how he found himself with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. He certainly didn't have, that's not typical attire. I mean, he would normally at least have had a toga on or something, you know. But here he finds himself in this position. Some commentators speculate that there was a big raucous, that they arrested Jesus, they're hauling him away. He hears about it and he leaps up perhaps out of bed and wraps this linen cloth and to go outside and then he himself is seized, caught up, identified. And they seized him. And he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. It's just interesting to me. One writer said, I'm not even sure why this is in the text. What is, what is the lesson we're supposed to learn? And then he went on this incredible stretch of how it's an example of the gospel. And I thought, oh, wow, that's... That's creative. Uh, but at least this much. Is it not a warning to us that how if we're not guarding our heart, if we're not feeding upon the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're not using the means of grace, that is his, his word and, and prayer and fellowship with the brothers and practicing self-denial and positively, actively engaging in service to others, if we're not doing that, that there is no end to which we will not go to escape being identified with him. One of the greatest indictments the world can ever make at us is when something comes up and we assert a Christian view or Christian values and they look and go, well, I never took you to be a Christian. He would rather be totally exposed than to be identified with Jesus. We don't know what happened to this young man. But I just wonder, in the day in which we live, when the pressures of the world are great upon you and me, they're, they're great to conform. Come on, everybody's doing it. It's okay, no harm. The, the lengths to which some will go, the exposure that they are willing to give to themselves to keep from being caught up and experience the implications of being identified as a follower of Jesus Christ. You see? We're not on the list of the top 50 yet of those countries where it's difficult to be identified as a follower of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it doesn't matter who gets elected Tuesday, November the 8th. This is coming to us. Miami City Council this week passed an ordinance making it unlawful to speak ill of Islam. It's hate speech to speak ill of one of the most hateful, diabolical worldviews ever to crawl up out from under a rock. What I'm saying right now is considered hate speech. To preach one man and one woman in a one flesh relationship for life is hate speech. To preach that abortion is murder is hate speech. To preach that men should use men's restroom facilities and women should use restroom, women's restroom facilities based upon their biological origin is hate speech.
Are you ready? Because I tell you, if the eleven who were closest to him fled at the first real sign of persecution, what will I do? What will you do? And so the lesson we learn is, I think, that we, we start right now feeding our souls. Because if you're not doing that now, if you're not praying, communing with God, those on earth have union with God the three in one and mystic sweet communion with those whose work is done. If you're not praying and in fellowship with God, I didn't say saying your prayers, praying and in fellowship with God. If you're not feeding upon his word, if you're not finding value in fellowshipping with the saints when, when the saints gather, then I don't know what you think will be made available to you to stand when the furnace blast of persecution comes. Because if you will read about these saints in the rest of the world, this is what keeps them from denying Jesus. He was arrested. He was betrayed. Betrayed by Judas, abandoned by the eleven. And I've got to honestly ask myself, and I just as I ask myself, I just want you to ask yourself, where would I have been in all of that? Don't ask where would she have been, where would he have been, where would be charitable with others, where would I have been? What will be written of me? Because history will tell a story. The future, when history is written, will tell a story. What will be said of us? I pray for you as I pray for myself. While I never imagined my name to be listed in anything like Hebrews 11, I just pray that it could be said of us as it was said of some of those folks, these of whom the world was not worthy. These of whom the world was not worthy. That they would rather spend a season of affliction with the people of God than to experience the pleasures of sin for a season. Because that's all they lack is a season. I'm offering you joy in the Lord Jesus Christ which lasts now into eternity. Not the bitterness of so-called pleasure. It turns, it may be sweet wine, but it always turns to bitter gall. The only way you find that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. A true, real, lasting relationship with Him. Religion won't do it. The pleasures of this world won't do it, but a true, personal, faith relationship with Jesus Christ will. The proof of that is what happened after this. And we're going to be looking at that. So don't give up on these guys just yet. But put yourself there. Can you say today with gospel honesty, all that thrills my soul is Jesus? It doesn't mean nothing else thrills you. It means that, that he is more than life to you. He, he, he is more precious than silver or gold or relationships. Because see, if not, then he needs to be. Because nothing else will stand you well. When, not if, when the furnace blast comes here. Come to Christ today. Trust in him. His life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Respond to his invitation to come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And you'll find rest for your souls because you see, to be yoked with Jesus is not constrictive and not confining. His yoke is easy and his burden is light, he promises. Come to Christ. Renew your love for Christ today. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, 
God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name and we look at this passage and, and we, would, we would be tempted if we didn't, didn't know ourselves better, we'd be tempted to say, how could they do that? And yet, Lord, I, I look at that and I say, why have I done that? And Lord, I don't, I don't want the final word to be better that he had never been born. Oh, how I long to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful unto death. So I pray for my brothers and sisters here. Some who may be struggling with waywardness, with coldness, with, with backwardness, lukewarmness. And I pray that their hearts would be re-engaged today and set ablaze again today. To realize that the only reason you let us inhale and exhale is to glorify you and find our chief joy in life in you. By loving you and obeying you. By living for Jesus Christ while we live so that when we come to die, it can be said of us that they died in faith. By being given grace to run the race to the end, to finish the course, to fight the good fight of faith, and to keep the faith, never to abandon it. Oh, help us, Lord. Help us. We see in the fickleness of the eleven our own fickleness. Find us faithful. Find us faithful at last. Forgive us of our sins. Renew us and refresh us and fill us with your spirit to be the people you've called us to be. But we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.